living in downtown with the hustle and bustle and noise and thing, I wanted to go away from it and uh, create a sense of peace. Well, this garden is is a real inspiration and escape, and uh, it's for me it's like a Zen experience. You know, the maximum to the minimum. The maximum of, of a variety into the smallest where every inch counts. Every inch yeah. counts. Isn't that so? And then the, it also draws very much together because planning it was fun. Yes. And disagreeing about everything was also fun. And then it draws that's together. That's how we get the best answer by, yes, uh, by, by uh, uh, checking... Uh, checking which this and that and this and, and that. And then we can think about it. You see, that's... Two things that your personality is so different than my personality, and the garden unites us. But for me, it's an oasis here downtown. Lots of people also think it's magical, you know, because of one little detail here and little detail there, a quietness. So many people come here and they say, "Your garden is magical." For me, it's just a pleasure, you know. But I'm glad that some other people feel that way, you know, because it's nice. If you have created something that people can communicate with, appreciate not only a like a, like something that you just bought, but appreciate the inner feeling of it. Because when they say magical, it's, that's what it is. Because I mean, it is the sense of peace that I've created. I uh, work in a basement where I locked all the windows and I need total silence in order to hear, in order to full concentration, no distraction. When I get exhausted and drained and I only can repeat myself and I see that there's nothing more for me, I come out here. Here, the distraction is all around me. There is light in every little branch and this and it's never the same, the light changes the light changes, the time changes, the seasons change, there is nothing the same. And it's always fresh, new, and really outdoorish. The reverse of my basement. So I have two worlds. The underworld, where I do sculpture, and the outer world, where I take a fresh breath. <laughs> I'm in love with this garden, totally in love, just like I'm in love with this lady. And this is just very unfortunate for me, because, you know, to be that extent in love, it really drains you. So, or it fills you, one of the two. It's the same thing, depends on what mood you're in. So I come out here, I get refilled. That's what it is, getting back into yourself, which is a process that you have to do when you're painting. Because if you're only thinking about the painting, uh, you're making design. But if you go into yourself, then you can create a world that can communicate with other people. Uh, so I try to create a little world for myself around here, and so in, through the year it's changed. And it's different, but it's another facet of my personality, I guess. The kind of artist I am is I am in the middle of the borderline between the yes and the no, in the vagueness of things in life. In my life, I realized that this cutting edge of the vagueness, it could be both yes, both no. And up to strange little nuances make the difference between the yes and the no. I got fascinated by Zen, I got fascinated by the yin yang, I got fascinated by the fiddler on the roof. On one hand, it's a, of, of course it's like this, but on the other hand, it's the reverse. And where are you? You're left in the middle to choose between the, the two hands. So it's up to you not to look for authority. That was my trouble. I didn't have any authority. Living without an authority, think of that. It's a terror. You have to decide. And that's my life. I hope that people will experience from my work the same wonder and the same spirituality that I experience in the sense of uh, really not, not, no, it's not so obvious. It's nothing tang tangible and it's highly personal.
So it comes that you come with one mood, you experience one thing. You come to the same sculpture with a different mood, you experience something else. And both things come from within. They come from really, really deep inside where feelings are active. And feelings are not, uh, it's difficult with words. You need poets in order to use words. I'm not a poet. You need musicians in order to suit its sound. And the eye can catch it in one shot. The instantaneousness is the thing that is so, so, so exciting and so all grabbing. You see it in churches, you see it in ancient religions, you see it in everywhere where the shaman used a guy like me in order to get his ma magic across with, to the tribe. That's what they did. When I get into my studio or look at the canvas, I think, first of all, of the size of the painting. I feel at a certain moment to do something uh, quite intimate and sometimes not. <laughs> and uh, the, that's w one of the beginning. And the other beginning is a general sense of color that will encounter, that will be in it. But this color is also involved with the ultimate message. I mean sensation that could be derived from that particular painting or drawing and because that link completely together these three elements are essential then after that then after that start the struggle because you know you put the skeleton of the painting or drawing or whatever and uh, then it seemed like everything is horrible you know, it's just poor. At first it's a feeling of freshness, and then after that it looks terrible. Till the very end, it's just like, oh my God, you know? It's really struggle. What I want to uh, give to the general effect of it, that it has no effort, that it has been just happened f freshly, like, a, like just a movement. And uh, so in my painting, it, it is happening like that. I mean, this is the way I'm working. I'm working from one element to another gradually. So I think uh, I could describe my work as... My God, which word should I find to say that? Well, my painting are, are abstract, for sure. But uh, they are also impressionist, but... Uh, you know, the best people to say a word like that are the uh, critic. I, I just can tell my own feeling about it, you know. I am an intuitive person, so I guess uh, it's, uh, it shows in uh, my works. Uh, if it didn't show, then I wouldn't be true to myself. The only way you can uh, give something is by being true to yourself. Uh, that's why there are so many different art that you see through the world, even in the same period where people uh, work approximately on the same style. But the thing is, uh, the personality of the, of the artist is showing it. But it shows only when the artist is really true to himself, and, and that's the only art that is good, whatever it is, whatever, writing, music, anything. That's, that's the essence, to be able to give the particular message of that person which is unique there's no two people the same to be creative i have to uh, be uh, excited and i have to have some stimulus the stimulus are to me mainly through uh, music reading uh, uh, looking at beautiful thing uh, so on so forth and um, and then I, all that uh, create this uh, this energy. Uh, even if you're very angry or very depressed, it's another type of stimulus. Not agreeable, but it is one kind of stimulus. And then after that, uh, you have to be alone. You have to have lots of time to be alone. Lots of time, private time. Uh, to sort of uh, gen 
get, let it grow inside of you. One of the important contributions that artists make to society is actually being contemporary. Society needs to see its face, and now with the fast turn of events in our time and day and age, every five years it used to be a generation, it used to be tradition, it used to be unstable, solid ground. Now the ground is shifting. The artist is the person who can tell us a little bit about that shifting ground. All artists, I mean the creative artists, the, the fine artists, they tell us about today and maybe speculate about the tomorrow. I like to speculate about the tomorrow, but it's nothing more than hopes, imagination, uh, limitations of my personality uh, get into the action too. Uh, the past took care of itself. It would not repeat itself for sure. My past for sure. It was a crazy past anyway. But the future, who knows it? The next, the next. So that's the, what artists should be doing. And society should squeeze them dry, really, to get the maximum out of them, because that's where the sparks of maybe something that is, is still incoherent of the future, or just a hint of the future, is there and firmed in materials. So it stays. Later on, it becomes history. Later on, it becomes heritage. Later on, it becomes a massive cultural uh, possession. At the time it happens, or when it happens, it's a big, big question mark to me. And I like it that way. My life is a question mark. I look like a question mark. Uh, when I start doing a painting or a drawing, uh, use, usually I don't make any sketch. I, uh, I got it all in my mind and uh, I let it sort of seep uh, for a while. I, I, I could be uh, reading the garden, taking a walk, uh, any sort of thing, and uh, that seemed to grow in my mind. And suddenly I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I, I feel ready to start. Then I put the first element of the painting, which is uh, I, the first element is to choose a, the medium. Will it be painting uh, on canvas? Will it be uh, a pastel or whatever? And uh, then size, approximative size. And then also the shape of the canvas, square. Sometimes I feel like working only in square type of painting. And then other times it's all elongated. So, so this is all the beginning. And then after that, the color, which come at the same time. The color, general color, general feeling of the emotion. The color I've chosen for the, uh, the impact that it will create on that, of that painting. Then you start it and you get desperate. You say, oh, it's not that, my God, how oh, can I do that? I mean, gee. Uh, and then gradually you stick to it and uh, it's built. And you can come to the finish that you can be excited and then you feel that you're on top of the world, Mount Everest and everything. But at other mo moments you're full of doubt. You know, but, but after the painting, even after being excited, you after that, you there's always a question of I could have done maybe more, maybe better. So then that's why you go on painting all your life. I spent with different medium all my life. Each way that you use the medium uh, creates a, a different type of uh, emotion. Maybe the same sort of thing, but it's expressed differently. You know, you can. It's like, like if you want to express something in English or whatever language, you have many ways to say the same thing, but some that are more understood uh, will be understood better by some people. Like for example. In the 50s, my paintings were rather somber background, you know, I mean, they were brownish or brown, uh, all sorts of different colors. And they were, the color was appearing like a little sparkle, you know, in it. And uh, then, so this was early 50s, and it was used with a, a palette knife. It went on in the medium, mid 50s, to become like splash.
you know, like more, more. And then at the end of the 50s, it was still with the uh, spallet knife, but it was more heavy, thick impact, and passed too. And uh, the, the color was sort of like repressed by mass of black that would sort of enclose them and, and the color seemed to want to explode through it, you know? And uh, the same system of force that I've been using in the 70s was done by, by this time with acrylic and with brush and with zillion of little lines, you know, to create a feeling of shiver, you know, around big mass. And, and this time it was with glaze. It took me uh, about like three, five months to make one painting. And then a friend of mine, uh, he was, uh, that is a painter, told me, listen, I see what you want to create this is Why don't you try airbrush? Airbrush. <laughs> so, anyway, I went to see what it is an airbrush because he was using it. And, um, I, I don't think I will like that because mechanic, I don't like mechanic. But I tried it a bit, you know. With the airbrush, what I like particularly of the airbrush, it is that it is like a pointies, in fact. You see, I mean, it's all little dot of color. Oh, and more there is, let's say, you start with a deep red, you go on spraying, it's not red first, it's barely pink, and then the more you give coat, the more it will fill itself and become deeper and deeper. But also you can create a transparency in a, in a much more, <laughs> well, interesting way for me, because like I can put an orange and put a blue over, and I keep the orange and I keep the blue. The, but however, it's like the, the orange is transparent through the blue, but you, you couldn't do that if you wanted the transparency normal, but those that can permit it. So, so I cannot say that I want only one medium because they give me something different. And, and I like that, but I, I'm not the person to like to do the same thing over and over again, far from it. I did some uh, print you know, uh, some litho and serigraphy and different type of thing. And, and uh, also pastel. And so it's using completely different, with pastel I use my hand and the crayon and everything. In a way, you know, I still believe in the old Zen thing that was fascinating me in the 50. You become one with them, you know, like the arrow, the archer, uh, to be a good archer has to be one with the arrow, with the bow, and with the, the, the object that is shooting, the, let's say the apple, you know, it has to be, if there is that complete concentration, you can be a good archer. You have to be one with the painting, one with the canvas, one with the color. And it triggers the imagination from different directions. And that's all I want to do. I want to trigger the imagination. If you're between 50 and 75, Norwich Union will insure you for life with no medical exam or health questions. Even with my heart condition, I didn't need a medical to be insured. And they didn't ask us any health questions. Your guaranteed life insurance can cost as little as $20 a month. Depending on your age and the premium you choose, you could be covered for up to $25,000. And in case of a fatal accident, your benefit triples up to $75,000. With the guaranteed life insurance plan, I'll have the affordable protection I need, and my premiums will never go up. Call this number now for your free personal enrollment kit. You're under no obligation, and no salesperson will visit. If you're between 50 and 75, you're automatically approved with no medical exam. Guaranteed life insurance from Norwich Union. Call toll-free 1-800-786-8593. An operator is standing by to take your call right now. That's 1-800-786-8593. A friend of mine told me, try AOL Canada. I said, why? I've got a computer. He said, try it. You'll see. It's simple. Every time you sign on, welcome. It tells you if you've got mail. You've got mail. Want to send some email? Type the message, click here, and it's done. I like this. With one click, 
I can browse all kinds of great features on AOL Canada. I've gotten help with my golf swing, planned my next vacation, even sampled the latest new sounds from much music. AOL Canada has over 100 newspapers and magazines, everything from Business Week Online to Cycle World, and I can browse them all. With AOL Canada, you can point and click your way across the Internet, and their web browser makes it easy to explore the World Wide Web. Call the toll-free number and you'll receive your free startup kit with everything you need to get online. It's worth a try. You'll see. Call 1-800-625-3939 now for your free AOL Canada Startup Kit with free software. It's everything you need to get online, so call today, 1-800-625-3939. What's going on tonight? A few magic words and presto. Will Be Daniels is the family dog. A dog with a lot of inside info on a certain jewel heist. The Shaggy Dog, a Disney movie special. Followed by Goldie Hawn and Steve Martin in the romantic comedy House Sitter. Their entire relationship is based solely on lies, and lots of them. Wrap things up with Sunday Report and Venture. That's what's going on tonight on CBC. What do I need to start on a new piece is a challenge, a real challenge. Now, I found to my great surprise that the challenge can come out of a sight. People say uh, or a corporation or a city or uh, some competition, that's a challenge. A site like the corner of Bloor and Church that's current crown life, the 150th anniversary of Toronto. Uh, what is, there are a million corners in the city. How can I make that corner unique? And that it doesn't look, my sculpture will not look like a decoration. That it looks like it belongs, that it's, it's, it's part of the life of the city there, in terms of the pedestrian traffic and everything else. That's a good example. So a site, uh, sites can be romantic, like uh, landscapes, uh, parks, waterfronts. A site is one thing. Another thing is intense nervousness that is unfocused, it floats all over, uh, it's, a, it's an overwhelming nervousness and tension and a lot of negative feelings. I go to the basement and I look at the models and uh, I say, which one of you bastards are going to grab me? And uh, one of them does, always. And then I have an insight. There's a conversation between me and it bypassing the brains completely. It ha doesn't have nothing to do with thinking, analytical thinking, linear thinking, it has to do more with uh, the activization of the imagination. And the imagination is like muscle, it needs activity. Muscles atrophy, imagination atrophies. So when there is a call of the imagination for some sort of activity, I give it a try. I just go down and look around. Oh, which one of you guys is gonna be the one that will trigger me. Turn on the key and the motor will start purring. So I started calling my sculptures for other people. I've noticed it's the same thing does, does it to other people, not just for me as an artist. That uh, I called my, started thinking of my sculptures, the little key that you carry in your pocket, it's with you all the time, you stick it in the ignition, turn on, and the, you, the motor of your car starts purring and comes alive and you can drive. So if my sculpture triggers that motor to drive, perfect. That's a good incentive. So what else do I need as an artist? Uh, I think I need challenge, I think I need recognition. I need to recognize my own nervousness. I need to recognize my own moments when I am focused uh, very rigidly on finances. How much would it cost to fabricate it? Including materials, including this or on the mechanics of getting a big crane and taking the sculpture over the roof because there is no other entrance like at the one that stands in the middle of Hamilton. So you have to know and go with it. Because if you try to do something else when you're sensitive to this thing, you do it twice. Once the bad way, the wrong way, the sloppy way or whatever, and once the right way. So recognize yourself. Make sure you know yourself. I was always uh, fascinated with nature flowers and then when I saw the first orchid I thought, oh, so graceful, so 
so peaceful, so elegant. My favorite orchids, in fact, are generally Pyranopsis. And people think it's only one flower. Pyranopsis has so many colors, different in shape, you know. This is a Pyranopsis, and this is also a Pyranopsis. And this is also a Pyranopsis. And so is this one. The reason why I like it so much, first of all, they are in bloom so long. And they have that sort of grace, you know, they have the lazy movement and you feel comfortable with them and also the variety of color there's some even yellow oh and the uh, the path are also ex very beautiful flower uh, this is this one is a dark one uh, but uh, there is some that are reddish and green also uh, they uh, they bloom only once a year generally sometimes two twice a year they last quite a long time uh, the phenopsis are uh, are a very avid bloomer, as a matter of fact, because, you know, they, they bloom and the, the spike of flower will last about easily three months. And, um, and sometimes they keep on growing another, another bud, another bud, you know. And this one has, has some more buds coming out. This is just, this is open a bit before. This one is just opening, so it's a little more colorful, you know. And uh, so there's some that I finished it. But it would be in bloom easily three months. And look, then there is another spike that's starting. It's really exciting. They, 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 uh, they love to bloom. And I love to look at them. And I congratulate them when they do some beautiful flower. And, and when they don't, I'm so sad. I tell them, why do you do that? What did I do to you? As a matter of fact, this is a very sad thing but you know flowers uh, are like that they're happy they bloom they're unhappy they die and make you very unhappy too <laughs> a good example of something that is alive that has an awful lot of energy in it is this the proportions are crucial you see this was a little less, I had to add that much in order to make it perfect. Why? Because this way, I wanted an expression of light for Ottawa, eternal light. Light, 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 flame going upward, upward. A sense of upwardness. Each one of them support each other. And then I turn it like that, and it holds its own completely. Completely holds its own. A full-blown sculpture which is different than the one before. Then I turn it that way. And to my amazement, it's valid. The pressures change, the movements change, so it's already, if the proportions are right, then it has more than one single way of acting. Here is another one where I, one of the earlier studies, like that. Interesting. Perfect balance, perfect balance. You can trust that one. I don't think you can trust that one. It's too, too dynamic, too, too mobile, too risky. And it triggers the imagination from different directions. And that's all I want to do. I want to trigger the imagination. And I was going to explain the structurals. In order to make them look like they just touch each other like that, I'll find the angle, but just in order to make sure that they look like they only touch each other, I have to deal with the structures. That's already another side, so I have to slant that in a way that I'll make a connection between the two bodies. That's already here, engineering, see? It still gives me a right, a chance to move it, still gives me a very good chance to control the angle, the touch, but once I weld here and once I weld there, 
that will be solid, then I can get a permit from the city to put it on the sidewalk, and it wouldn't fall on anybody's head. That's, that's, the, <laughs> that's the other part. So once I stop being Koso the dreamer, the sculptor, the this, I have to become Koso the, the contractor to contract it, execute it, place it, get the permit. This was my uh, excitement about Stonehenge. Stonehenge activated me. I felt that dragging those stones all the way and placing them up was a spiritual experience for the people who made it. It was more than just a, something like a sundial. So I wanted a contemporary, physical, let's say, if I'll place people in it, make it monumental, and have it change personality, be a variety of, of, of presences in, in, in summer, in winter, and during the day, during the, the shadows, the whole thing would be more like a temple, like uh, an ode to, 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 to life, uh, and express something extremely contemporary. Our own passage, our own rites of passage, we can pass through it and it's an achievement to pass through it. That feeling makes the shape not silent, not sculpture, not architecture, but something in the category of what the ancients used to build as temples and churches and whatnot. To live with another artist that is very, very vital, very, uh, very strong, is uh, very exciting because uh, you, you, you never have to change your world. You know, I mean, like if I was with a dentist, you know, I don't maybe the dentist would like my painting, but might be not understand my processes of thinking and and vice versa. So I, I, I like that, and um, as we have both have great respect for each other's work, so uh, it's, we have a very interesting exchange. I, I wouldn't want anything different, you know? I don't see my... I mean, I, I have some friends that are dentists and businessmen, but... No, 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 I mean, that's friend fine. <laughs> a young person that wants to be an artist, this, this, it's not only aspiration that they need to be, to asp aspiring to be, they have to want desperately to be a painter or sculptor or anything because it's not the easy life. There is nothing glamorous about it. It's art, art, work and stamina because, you know, you get a whole loads of thing against you, I mean, you got to get yourself known. But you got to have, uh, uh, have uh, stay with your own ID, not be changing because the, 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 the fashion change. Because the fashion does change. You can be extremely famous at one moment and uh, then suddenly, I don't know, the, the world changed, they want only a certain sort of thing and so you don't change with that. You have to be able to have a total conviction, total need, because it doesn't what the, the game otherwise. It's too, it's too risky, it's too uncertain. It's, you have to have a burning thing. <laughs> it's funny to say, but it, that's why I feel it. The artist is the one who is challenging himself or herself to do something with the talent so it's like like uh, squeezing the moment and being sensitive and in control it calls for a multiple personality you have to be a manager you have to be a, the guy who gets the orders you have to be so you get you learn yourself to be sensitive to your own moments grab them use them if you succeed in that then society uses you because you can produce you, they can be sure that you produce results yet in order to get them quiet off my back i had to make a company 
R Elul Arts Incorporated. R for Rita, Elul is Elul Arts Incorporated. And when they see a corporation incorporated, oh, we can make a contract for one of those large sculptures with this guy. He's a corporation. They wouldn't trust me because artists cut their ear off. Artists are untrustable. Artists are by the mood. Artists are crazy. Artists are everything, you know. So artists live on the fringe of society. Their self-torture, their self-questioning, their sensitivity could be used by a little bit of help from society. Understanding is the first thing. Instead of that, they make a romantic thing out of the artist. This goddamn Van Gogh story and Gauguin story and all that sort of thing spoiled life for so many people. If you cut your ear off, you're a genius. You didn't sell a painting in your life, you're not a genius. American society have developed the cult of the dollar. European society has developed the cult of the tradition. You come to Canada, you're free. They asked me, what do you like about Canada? I said, the fact that nobody in St. John gives about a damn about Toronto. Nobody in Toronto thinks much about Vancouver except as a great place for a vacation or a cottage and so and so forth. And there are spaces between things, spaces between people. You can be yourself here. My best work was done here. So Toronto is my country. I can be as, as nationalist as Paris is over there. Why not? I know, they, they can play act the whole thing, but in fact, Canada is blessed with this sense of 300 years history. In Europe, they'll throw 5,000 years history at you, 500 years history, etc., etc. It's weight on your shoulders. You are expected to conform. You are expected to, to adjust into the mold and the mold of the... Here, you can be yourself. That's the biggest thing that I want to tell the young, the young artists. Be yourself, primarily. Everybody would see you. You'll make good if you work on yourself. Because you are a whole universe within yourself. Work on that universe.